Okay, so welcome everyone uh, to our joint um, broad MIT EECS uh, colloquium that is housed by the Eric and Wendy Schmidt Center and AIND um, within MIT EECS. So I'm very excited to have Fabian here, Fabian Theis here with us today. I think there's only one person in computational biology who can fill a room, even though it's in the middle of summer after a July 4th uh, weekend. Uh, so thank you all for coming by. Um, so Fabian is uh, the head of Helmholtz Munich's Computational Health Center and also director of um, Helmholtz AI. Um, and he's also a professor in the Technical mm. University of Munich. So he actually has two PhDs, um, which I didn't know before <laughs> reading it up. Uh, so one in <laughs> computer science and one in physics, one from Germany and one from Spain. Um, and then he has had uh, various research positions um, in Regensburg and then in Göttingen before mu moving to Helmholtz Munich. So research-wise, I guess uh, you're all here because you know what he does. Um, so he has pioneered a lot of ML um, at the intersection with the biomedical sciences, in particular in the, in the context of single cell biology and transcriptomic biology. Um, really developed many, many very widely used methods for visualizing, for pre-processing, for modeling, and then for understanding heterogeneity in uh, single cells. And I'm sure we'll hear a lot of that today, plus maybe also spatial contexts more newly, and of course, a lot of perturbation settings. And what I'm also excited to announce is that given the shared goals of uh, the Eric and Wendy Schmidt Center and Helmholtz Munich, uh, we just uh, are in the process of assigning a research collaboration, which we will get started with a joint conference. Yeah. Um, so everyone stay tuned about that as well. So with that, Fabian, the floor is all yours. Yeah, thank, thank you so much, Caroline, for first, of course, kind invitation, but then also for the possibility of, of, of being here. It's just so fantastic to be back in, in, in Boston. I really realized this is the first time in Boston for me after the pandemic, and I've been there so many times, so like just running around this morning, jet-lagged as I was at five o'clock or whatever at Charles River, it feels like you know, coming home, and, and then sort of this at least being the same. All the construction outside was a bit new to me, so I don't know what's going on there. I mean, since you came cover, they just built up all these dormitories for students or what, I don't know. But that, 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 was, that was really impressive. So, so thanks for having me. I wanted to briefly, uh, sort of give a bit of an, an overview over what we've been doing, but not maybe so much just review papers that we have been doing. Of course, I will be doing this a bit, but maybe show one or two new vignettes that, 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 that we, we have, but then maybe also sort of end a bit in the discussion of you know, what we could maybe be doing with a bit more generative modeling in particular. And then at the end, I would even drop the foundation model discussion thing. And we started this a bit this morning. I really want to see what, what you guys think about it. We have a human cell atlas conference coming up next week in, in Toronto, where I'm sure a few of you will also be going. And you know, at that time, we will also be discussing, maybe is the human cell atlas in some sense giving us a bit of a foundation model? You know, is, it, is that maybe the thing that we should do to then transfer everything on top of it? And you know, if that's the thing, should we maybe even do that and also in this spatial setting? So I think there's a bunch of fun questions that I think you, you amongst many of the places is, is the thing to discuss. So I'm, I'm really excited to, to, to talk about that. So how, how we... Um, maybe started thinking about the field was I actually came into single cell genomics from tunnels microscopy. So I've always been very early on interested in dynamics, right? And I, I still think nowadays it's such a cool question that because we have so many cells, you know, maybe we can reconstruct trajectories. Maybe we can really reconstruct sort of situations where, where cells then maybe sort of turn off the righteous path of healthy aging and go into, I don't know, neurologic disease, cancer, whatever. And you know, maybe we can even then see, sort of identify the regions when this branching points or regions are happening. And then maybe we can even use some sort of causal inference to tell us what goes wrong to sort of perturb it back to the healthy path. So there's a bunch of really exciting questions to be asked on single cell data, particularly if we have a maybe time resolved a version or so of that, that makes this very much amenable to um, machine learning questions. So that's why I think a lot of us in computation biology have since then taken up that question. And this is what my lab focuses on. So we're interested in using machine learning methods, in particular in single cell genomics. And we've been putting a lot of time into, for example, state transition learning uh, coming up with, with first pseudo time models, but then you know, adding additional information. And of course, since then, there's, there's, there's a lot of really exciting directions. Clicked also with this RNA velocity metabolic labeling field. And so I won't be speaking about that today, but very happy to discuss at the coffee break or at the ample sweets that you got. I actually brought some German sweets as well, if someone still wants to, but I mean, you might be full already with this other, so 
I can throw it. <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to share. So I, I, I thought I, <laughs> you might be, like I was full already from, from the brownies and, and the other stuff, but you know. I, I thought it's always a good idea to bribe your audience, you know. <laughs> it just, it just, <laughs> yeah, I don't, I, I don't want to. So I, I just got told by, 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 the, by the technician, we should not throw people, things to computation-minded people. They're not good at handling that. <laughs> so, so we've been into, into this, this trajectory uh, learning early on. Then we've been thinking quite a bit about data integration. And I, I think this question for, let's say, a particular organ atlas, right? This cannot be a single labs type of effort. And early on, you know, every paper was called an atlas of immune system and this thing and so on. But I think nowadays we maybe agreed that we actually need to chuck things together and have the variability of, of people also mapped on top of that. So I think that, 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 that's a fun question. And of course, more recently, we've been putting a lot of effort also into the, the, the spatial side of things and then having all kinds of applications with experimental partners. We, we run a dry lab, so that's why these interactions are so important. And that's why, of course, we very often also look to the Broad Institute, how you guys have set up these often interdisciplinary labs that sort of do both things at the same time or interact with the computation minded people. It's a really fantastic model. Um, before I now uh, tell you what I actually want to tell about I mean, uh, uh, so, so sort of these, 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 these perturbations, I want to just say that I think engineering matters so much in, in our field, so I wanted, usually I just put it at the end, but I sort of pulled it up front. Because I have the impression, at least in, in my lab, it, the whole thing analysis really took off when we had good tools. Early on, you know, it took us like two years to analyze the first single set data set, so we came up with this scan pipe pipeline to just have something more efficient. And since then, we realized that this is not something you can maintain yourself. So you know you need to build a community around it. So we build up what we now call SCVerse. I'm not sure you saw that. Um, so it's this, this, this idea. And this is a, a big, big consortium where, for example, Oli Stegler, Nir Yosef, and many others contribute, but also Dana and Aviv and others uh, uh, help us develop this, where we sort of have this, this shared data structure and then put um, sort of a bunch of core packages in that we actually jointly co-develop so you know, people can help each other, then you have sort of the, the ecosystem around it. So if you're interested in that, I think we are about to set up a first hackathon also on, on, on east side of that, where you, know, you can contribute, sort of bring your own tool in or sort of make it adaptable to new situation. I think it's something we need as community and, and I think what you now see in machine learning where you're more and more companies take up some of these things, I think it's, you know, we should sort of keep it also with, with us. And this, this, the second thing is that, of course, we also have a spatial side things, and I won't be speaking much about spatial examples today, but I, I want, want to mention a few of these. Uh, one of this is our funnily named SquidPy, which I think, Giovanni, you came up with the name because ScanPy sounds like a scumpy, and then they wanted to stick with the ocean theme of naming things, which, <laughs> I think it stands for spatial quantification or so. But in, in any case, you, you, you get the idea that you can basically do a spatial statistics. But what we realized is that the underlying data structure was not very adapted yet to, to the thing. So just, just stay one more with, once more with the engineering. We put basically some time into a, a, a framework where we can actually store multimodal images in a robust fashion and operate on them and sort of subselect and transform them in a joint fashion. And with discussions I had today, for example, with, with Evan and Fred Fine, many others, I mean, it's so fascinating that you guys start doing so many of these multi-omic settings. I think also in, in sort of more normal labs, people do, let's say, a Visium together with a Xenium or something like that. You want to operate on this, on h &E just. So we've been putting some time in there, and then we've been also sort of disseminating a, a bit, bit that works. So if, if you want to get into the field, at least for us, you know, first students need to read then on SE best practices, which is also an open thing. So please contribute if interested. It's sort of the one plug. And, and one thing that's just upcoming, I, I just wanted to briefly throw on a slide. This is work by, by Lucas and, and, and Yuga, where we come up with a package where we actually have really specifically allow annotation also of multi-conditional data, which I think for these perturbation data sets that, that many of you, I know at least in, in your lab, Colleen, are interested in, it's actually interesting to build not only a latent space of the expression of the cellular space, but of all these sort of additional annotations and so on that we have, right? And once you have that latent space, often you can just really focus on that. And you know, you can maybe sort of build a better sort of phenotypic representation of the, the drug space that you use to perturb or things like that. So we've been putting some, some sort of engineering effort into that and then you can sort of not just annotate cell space but then you have sort of models for perturbation space and do some analysis. And it's sort of just a ground framework so it's always modular so you can plug in your, your own things on that. All right. So I wanted to talk about generative modeling and I know it's a bit cheesy to, to put that on, on, on the titles nowadays but I know it's how, how now, how it is about you. So I guess who's working or using machine learning in parts at least? 
Yeah, that's what I was expecting, right? But when I talk to my family or, or to my parents a year ago about AI, you know, that was not so much enthusiasm, but I think it has changed in the past half year. And I think you, you guys must have all felt it. So maybe some people are asking you, hey, you work in AI, what are you actually doing, right? And so I think it's worthwhile thinking about what, what has changed and how we could maybe also leverage that. And uh, you know, I, we don't want to make now a, a podium discussion about how to use large language models, but I do think there's something to, to, to be learned here. And you know, obviously, traditional thing, we've been doing supervised discriminative things. So we've been knowing how to discriminate cats and dogs, but it's been a hard problem, right? I mean, this has been something that even though nowadays we take it as a given, you know, computer science has been vexed by that for I don't know, 50 years or something like that. And, and then computer vision completely changed. And the question is, you know, how would that happen in our field? So I, I remember this was literally, I think, four years ago when we had single cell genomics conference. This was the last time I was presenting here. And uh, yeah, I, I think Aviv was still hosting and I was coming in and I was like presenting first our, our autoencoders for embedding and so on. And then, then and I think both Dana and John and like some others say, well, what are you starting with all these new network stuff? We don't interpret things anymore. But now obviously everyone is sort of moving that because the data sets get so large and the complexity is so high. So I think it's a natural move and we should think about what that would mean in our setting. So you know, we have unsupervised case typically, I mean, we do have cell type labels, but you know, it's, it's not that rich. So it's typically, you know, we want to explore things. We just want to find groupings of cells and so on. So this is the, the, the typical setting that we have. And I think one of the most exciting um, developments, you know, in terms of challenge, what we want to do in that, of course, is ideas such as human cell atlas, where, you know, we want to build like this periodic system, not of elements, but, but of cell types, where, you know, for example, my lab has been focusing on, on the lung and I, I, I briefly just say what we've been doing recently with, 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 with integration, but I think it's clear that if you have such a thing, that this is a very useful resource, not just for, you know, you computational being interested in you know, benchmarking things on a larger scale, which to be honest is a very big motivation why everyone now starts talking to Lisa in my lab because she's been setting up that 45 data sets uh, lung cell atlas. And suddenly you have something where you can really robustly do hold out one data set and see how well you can validate, which you know, we didn't have so much maybe before. But you know, in this case, for example, during, during, during the pandemic, each of these, these columns would be a subject and a healthy one in, in case, and we just look where entry genes for SARS-CoV-2 were actually distributed. And we found that they were, I mean, not just in, in the lung, but for example, also in particular uh, smell associated regions in the brain. And you know, what we found in the lung was actually because we had so many people, we could actually start doing association study. And I think this is now what we slowly see happening. Maybe we spoke about 1K, 1K. But I think there's, there's a bunch of these things where now, you know, people, and in this case, you know, we just had, I think, 100, 150 people. So we could associate these entry genes. And we saw that the, 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 the levels of, 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 uh, of uh, SARS-CoV-2 entry genes was higher in male that were, that were smoking a bit older or something like that. So you can do these type of GBAS association type of things. No, I think also with the single cell resolution, it's going to be exciting. So if we want to build these joint representations that are not just one lab, right? We need to do some type of integration. And I have this visualization that a guy from, I think, some university campus in, I think, Chicago, so was basically going around campus asking people to draw a map of the world, okay? And, you know, if you ask me, maybe, you know, I do a job, something like that, but a few of them just forgot Australia and one and Antarctica. But because he's been asking many of them, you know, he was just like superimposing them and then he, you know, he's, he, he kept, found, kept finding Australia. And it's kind of what we, I think, want to do with our single cell assays as well. You know, we might maybe have, not this one particular cell type present, or you know, we might have sampled from a different region, and we kind of want to have our reference be robust across all of this, right? So this, this is this, this idea. So what we typically see if, if we do a study and we just have a, a single data set, you know, we cluster it. And I know, Carlo, you just told me before, it's kind of boring because you always do the same, but you know, I mean, people still nowadays have exactly that workflow, right? So did you go cluster, then we annotate it because these are our markers, right? But if we do it again for a different one in the same space without sort of any, technical correction, it doesn't look like that. And I, I remember it was like four years ago, so when these sort of few more data sets came out, we actually saw that linear methods for batch correction were doing a fantastic job, it was fine. But now with so many of these data sets, this doesn't cut it anymore, so you do something, and we, here we just call it data integration, but de facto means sort of you know, superimposing things, and, and you, I guess all of you know that, many of you know that this has been I think keeping community busy for, for, for quite some time to do these type of things. So one of the, the, the type of approaches that you can do to build such an atlas is basically use representation learning, right? So we have these, these just typical autoencoder type of structures where you might want to adopt the loss. You know, if it's just mean squared error, it's just a PCA if everything is linear, right? So that's maybe a way how to think about it. But you know, they adapted maybe to, 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 the, uh, to the particular count situation of the data. 
and then you throw in your, your sparse gene by cell matrices, and obviously, you know, because you, you make it compress in, in that bottleneck, you reconstruct and you can use it, for example, for denoising. But, you know, if you add now a covariate here, so if you make a conditional autoencoder, conditional variation autoencoder, you can then use that information to more efficiently encode in the latent space, in the bottleneck, as it's called here, and then you uh, remove that batch effect in a more consistent fashion. So this is what you can do, and what we see, for example, here in this example, this was one, one of the first papers, so, so Nir Yosef and, and myself, we had sort of the first two uh, as, um, encoder papers, and you know, what, we just, what we just did, where really encoding is to two dimensions, so this is just neuron one versus neuron two in the bottleneck, just for visualization, typically this is much higher dimensional, and this is just PBMCs, and you see that the different PBMCs just illustrated here by different, uh, different cell types here by different color, they were actually looking like a typical U-map. Right, so this, this bottleneck encodes some structure. And this was actually the most interesting finding for me from that paper, that you know, those, those latent spaces, they're actually maybe amenable to questions. So you can now add some type of priors to that, or you can maybe interrogate them, or you can visualize them as a joint, joint atlas, right? And yeah, then we ran some, some competitions. This was NeurIPS, uh, I, I think two years ago, we had like something more than 250 people participating, next one even, even more. And pretty much for most of these tasks, even though we had this, so sort of simpler concept of you know KNN graphs to do the integration. Most of the, the neural network type of topics are waiting for you know style transfer things like that. It might be a bit of an observer bias. You know if you ask people at neurobs conference to contribute, they might be choosing more of these type of approaches. But I think it tells us that you know these these type of general frameworks are a, a, a way to go. So let's say we have an, an atlas, right? What are sort of principles and, and tools and, and, and questions that you can do with that? Let's say we have a human lung cell atlas and we want to now use it. And we've been, I think, early on, the first HCA white paper sort of putting up some questions that you can ask to that atlas. You know, where is my cell? Where is my gene program? How does my new data set map on top of it? But it's not entirely clear what the good questions are and how you would formulate them as, 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 as a method as well. So a simple one, I, I think many of the questions could be formulated that as factoring out over first, integrate the data set into that reference, and then you'll do something with it. It's like a pre-training concept in a sense, a little bit, right? So you have your pre-trained reference and you just sort of put on top of it. So yeah, in, in, in L, I guess you would just call this not just doing things separately. I don't know how this is for, for, for you, but in many cases we write, we have a nice data set, we analyze it, we write a paper and we sort of go on to the next one. But we often maybe don't want to look back, but either you want to transfer that information, right? So it's a simple transfer learning problem. And this is the idea what we did here. So essentially we take the neural network that we showed before, and because this has been all a while, so I, I won't now show you the exact idea, but what we essentially do is we modify the structure of the network so that if you have our reference here, that any new data comes in, it's gonna be sort of projected on top of this one in a robust fashion. Okay, so this, this, this is how that, that would work. And we've been applying this now to build, for example, this uh, integrated lung cell atlas that just came out. And that's for us a bit of an example that we now do this for other organs in HCA as well. So here, Lisa, very talented PhD student, was masters at, at Dana's uh, and then, then joined myself and Malte who's now moved on to become a P PI. We took initially just 40 data sets and I, I should say this was a big collaboration with the whole human lung cell atlas network, particular uh, Sasha Misharin and Martin Awain. We, we harmonized a bunch of these cells so there was really an, a big effort with the expert community to annotate this actually in different levels because you know people often agree that these epithelial cells but then something downstream can be very different. So just harmonizing that was a bit of an effort, seeing where they come from and also putting anatomic location together, but then you build this core atlas. But then, you know, during that time, there was always new data sets coming in. So basically what we then did, we used this transfer learning approach that was just sort of very quickly highlighting before, and then added the new additional new data sets on top of it so that we had something like 2 million cells and more than 400 individuals in this, this resource. And because we use transfer learning, we have a very clear way also now how to extend this one and sort of update it. And while this works, there's still a bunch of issues. For example, we don't yet have very good uncertainty models for that. So I think really, I mean, I, I, I think just the variational is not cutting it. So that's just too local. So I think maybe there's something to be fully Bayesian, just being more fancy there. I think, I mean, that's, that's, that's a cool community of, of, of people doing some um, really full deep uh, Bayesian deep learning. And that's maybe a way to go, but I'm, I'm not entirely so. So, you know, I think, I think this, this is gonna be interesting. But once we had this now, we could ask a bunch of questions. So we could sort of, we really say, hey, now that we have this variation across so many people, what can we actually do? And you know, we, show, we show, for example, that you now find, of course, a, a few new cell types. You can sort of maybe do some type of marker mining. You can do all kinds of association, as I was saying before. But then can then also annotate new data. And that sounds rather straightforward, but that's really useful. In, who has used cell typist or something like that before? 
Anyone? That, that's really useful, right? So it's just a, I mean, that's like, a, if you can, you could call it maybe even, maybe not a foundation, but it's a pre-trained model that you just sort of chuck on top of your data. And do you then re-annotate or are you happy with it? Just take it? Yeah, exactly, right? So I think, well, I think, I think you're just having that thing out of your workflow, maybe even including the embedding, I think that would really improve things. So what we found as, as, as one of the results, for example, because now we had this actually integrated across many diseases was that, you know, there was, there was some type of uh, uh, a monocyte, uh, 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 some particular set of macrophages that I think was sort of consistent across a bunch of, 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 of diseases. So we, we had this, I think, hypothesis, some type of scar tissue formation was actually consistent across uh, was sort of systematically for forming. And this, I, I think we spoke briefly about this, this scarring type of thing. So I think some of these hypotheses can be derived more systematically here. All right, but of course, this is all still the discriminative thing. So just going back to this, to this sort of plug slide here, we could also think about how to do it generatively. And de facto, people have been, of course, mostly doing this already with this ration and code. So you know, instead of doing this, just sort of separating things, what you actually want to do, you want to learn distributions. So you want to learn, for example, class distributions, could be initially very simple Gaussian, as we did maybe in, in sort of sim sort of si simple models. But you know, of course, you you can sort of do this. So this is, I think, what, what's needed. And once we have that, maybe we don't even need to store samples of our models. You know, maybe if we really have a very good distribution, we don't need to store the two million samples or so that this atlas has. Maybe we don't even you know we don't go through all these security issues that you know, at some point maybe sharing this together with genetic information maybe gets sort of a bit problematic. And this like a big part of HCA has been sort of just relying on the whole getting the whole legal thing sorted out. I don't know if someone is around from DCP. Anyone? DCP still? I know, I know Tim was, and this has been keeping busy a lot. So you know, we don't want to do this. So maybe encoders are useful for that. So Nears, uh, Nears lab came up with SCVI and all the variants thereof. And that's essentially you know, just like the same, but, but you know, what you just do here is then in, in, instead of uh, you just, just sort of encode maybe mean and variance if you have a Gaussian or something like that and just sample from latent space and suddenly you can get distributions, right? So I think this kind of maybe a little bit uncertainty where use of atlases. People don't really use uncertainty so much, so I think there's some work to be done. But I want to share two, two vignettes that we, that we now do with this sort of little bit going towards generative side of things. Namely, um, a, a method where we think about sort of where population is localized, but also one where we uh, want to add a phenotypic mapping on top of that. So, I mean, in the end, and this is just the motivation why I want to show these examples, in the end, we don't really care what a single cell does, right? I mean, we have so many, we just like sample a bit more. But we maybe do care what the, the overall sort of one larger scale structure is, you know, what sort of the, the tissue construction there, what's maybe the, 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 the organism phenotype or things like that. So I think, and there's already big discussions as sort of HDA follow-up talking about multi-scale models. And I think many, many of, of, of people here sort of dealing with image-based assays are sort of going already one scale up. So how can we, Put these together, and, and you know, I, I think maybe maybe happen sort of implicitly, if you do sort of different resolution or Steffi, right? You call it hops in, in in the graphs, things like that. You know, you could maybe sort of have a multi-scale representation, but I, I think there needs to be a bit bit more thought about. So, so this first thing that we wanted to uh, that I want to show you, this came out in Bioarchive a few months ago. We call it SC Puli. This is population level integration. So what we observe is like in in, in this typical architecture encoder decoder, right? That uh, we actually want to inform this by cell type labels beforehand, and that would help us derive cell type labels for new data sets right away. So we want to basically just augment the loss, You're not just having a variational loss, but also have sort of a reference loss here. It's a bit like scan VI, it's a bit sort of a different fashion, but that's useful. The second observation that we made is, that if we really want to go big, we have many samples. So you know, this, this, this covariate space that's typically one hot encoded doesn't cut it anymore. You know, at some point, this thing here is just much, much larger than the rest. And it's actually also not really interpretable. So could we go beyond one hot encoding? And it's sort of this simple idea that we just learn embeddings instead. Okay, so, so we basically have here a bunch of embeddings that we train that are sort of shared across all of the samples and just gonna train together with this thing. And then you have this latent space of the embeddings that you can actually also be done hierarchically, which I think is very useful if you have what we call sort of hierarchical batch effects or something like that. But you can then sort of see what the difference between the samples, how, how they've been sort of used to then learn, learn a joint latent space. You see sort of which ones have been pushed on top of each other, which ones haven't been modified so much. And you can then also use during query time when you sort of just fix your atlas and then map on top of it. You don't actually need to change the network as we, we used to do with uh, single cell architecture surgery with SC arches, but instead you just need to learn a bunch of new embeddings, right? So the fine tuning is sort of completely delegated to the new embedding learning. And then you can also sort of learn the new landmarks as well. 
So that's the idea. Oh yeah, and I should say, I had this sort of here as observation because I wanted to skip the, the, the supplementary figure part. But we see that we actually get pretty, uh, pretty uh, similar, maybe even a bit outperformance with respect to other methods that are sort of either specific for label transfer or for, for data integration. So label transfer, that would be cell typist or for data integration. So let me show you how this works on the lung. So this is uh, HLCA, a subset of it, uh, trained. And, and you see sort of it integrates uh, kind of nicely across studies and cell types. But what you, what you also see is that, you know, the, the integration performance is actually quite good. It's even a bit better than the, the scan VI method that we used to build HLCA, which is nice. Maybe it's been, I mean, let's just call it comparative. But what is nice now, we can now zoom in and look at this, 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 this vector space of conditions that I, I was showing you before, the one hot encoded thing, right? And this is these dots here. So each of these dots now is one of the studies that I used, or one of the subjects actually that I used to be integrating it so we didn't group by, I, I shouldn't have put, yeah, the color is study, but the dots is, is the vectors. So, and you see that if you color them by studies, mostly within a study, we didn't correct much, but across studies, we corrected quite a bit. And you see also this one sort of uh, 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 pops out a bit here. And if you then go by sample type, you see that, you know, and, and I don't see colors that much, but I do think this one is a uh, organ donor and this will be alive. Is that correct? It's the other way around? Well, next time. But you didn't see that, 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 that there's a difference here. And yeah, then you can also go into the reference mapping. So let, let's make this one scale larger, right? Because now we know we, particularly in PBMCs, there's really man, many cells around. So in this case, we, we looked into 8 million PBMCs. Um, and uh, this was across maybe 25 data sets, but quite interesting ac across the more than 2,000 individuals, right? So there again, you can sort of integrate everything and then things look nicely, but, and, and I think this is kind of, kind of interesting now. Now you look again at the embedding, so at the vectors that you use to sort of make the samples move on top of each other. So this is sort of the, pop this is the population level variation. So each of these dots, even though it looks like the typical UMAPs we are known, is actually just a PCA of that embedding space. Each of these dots is a single subject, and, and sort of on top of each of these dots, something like 2,000 cells or so sit in order to make this 8 million data set. Well, it's not 2,000, it should be 4,000. Okay, so that makes up this 8 million data set plot, right? So it's kind of nice, right? So suddenly now we're in this re regime where we have, because we have so many subjects, we have these two scales. So we have this sort of detailed single cell variation scale, but here we have also this population, maybe not variation scale, but you know, set of vectors that were used to correct to build this integrated one here. And now you can ask, you know, what, what is actually changing? So what type of embeddings have been sort of be, ha, needed to be modified to make this in joint embedding here? And you can sort of, for example, plot, plot SA, and you would expect, you know, as you see, expect the first principal component is just dominated a lot by SA. But then you can also look into disease, and there's also sort of strong association, I think, this first and second principal component to disease. And you see that the healthy ones map there, and there's a little bit more uh, disease per, per, per ones. So stepping back, I think this shows you that you can do this embedding and it sort of goes maybe direction towards and maybe a little bit sort of in, in, in increasing the scales. And I think if we now start looking into spatial assays, for example, you, know, you want to actually use some of these concepts to uh, have a tissue embedding or so, something like that going on. The second part I want to talk about is how to map now a phenotype uh, on, on top of this. So a typical question is that you maybe want to have sort of in this really coarse-grained fashion. I, I'm not saying that we will be doing single cell genomics something like that in the clinics, but you know, we could ask, let's say we have a clinical phenotype, can we use this one to really predict now, so to predict, hey, this is, this is healthy versus control, versus where this stage A, B, C, or something like that particular disease. And if you start thinking about that, it's actually not as straightforward, because very often, let's say this would be the four cells that we measured in our healthy subject, versus maybe two, two, uh, two particular diseased ones, and you do see that, of course, many of the cells would be just some type of bystander cells that wouldn't actually really in, sort of matter very much for the thing. It's, you need to pick up the cancer cells, right? And if you just do a fixed assay of, let's say, four cells, very often relative frequencies might also not cut it because, you know, let's say if there's more of these orange disease cells, as indicated here, and I think I got the color right this time, right? Uh, then, then, uh, then you see the other ones would go down. That's why this relative frequency comparison is always a problem. So what you actually want to do is you want to compare these bags of, of cells, right? So in machine learning, this is called multiple instance learning. And you know, I, I've, I've been sort of trying to get that to work in the lab for a few years, and we didn't have enough data sets and so on, but I think now this is actually finally working. So, and, and this is an idea that's not, not very new or so in the single cell field in general, but is, is I think maybe new in the single cell RNA-seq or so field, because you know, images, of course, people have been doing this on patches for, for, for a long time. And I think this is from Max Welling, where he's been also sort of combining this already with attention-based essays. So what we do, is you know we we take we take we take the typical encoder decoder type of architecture as before, 
And actually here we have a multi-grade version, so we call this multi-grade because it's multi-modal. And there's a, there's a really nice trick here also how to sort of make this only take one, not all modalities. But the key point now is that we just don't do it only for a single cell, but we do it for the whole bag, which is like from the same patient, right? So you do this for, for many at the same time, you just do it independently. But then for those cells in the bag, and this might be the full set of patients, might be just like a sort of a, a batch of that. You do then a pooling on top of it, and then you do your classifier. And then for each of the cells, you now have a weight because of these pooling weights that can actually tell you, hey, this cell has been actually used for the prediction and those, those set of cells not. So you don't only get the prediction, which is kind of nice, but you get also an inter interpretable, interpretable prediction, something that tells you, hey, this, this set of cells do, do matter. And then you can also write up a query version of that. So if you do this now, for example, for the human lung cell atlas or for a subset of that, and you see a pattern here, it's really useful, we've been reusing that a lot. Um, we build a reference and it looks as, as you would expect, sort of nicely mixed and condition specific. But what you can now do is now you could look, now you can look at these attention maps, basically plot on top of it. And you, you, you sort of see it for the curie, so the curie is mostly mapped map there. But then uh, also for, you see a difference because this was COVID, so we had moderate as well as severe annotated ones. And you do see those actually differ, those attention maps. So, so you know, in order to predict difference between moderate and severe, so we looked at different places in that, that, that uh, um, um, atlas. And if you zoom in, you actually see that there's a difference between a sort of, sort of regions here in, 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 in the macrophages. So this particular macrophage region here, you see that uh, these ones would be sort of more tissue resident ones, where these ones would be more monocyte associated ones. And in the severe case, indeed, uh, it's known that those ones would be the ones driving it. So you actually pick up a, a, a phenotype that has been described before just with this attention type of, of thing. And then you com can compare it and you see that it sort of performs with uh, sort of equal accuracy as, as sort of other type of, of things that are performing. Simpler ones, but you know, has this interpretability on top of that. So I think that can be a very useful way how we deal with uh, not just a prediction, but essentially I think sometimes also differential comparisons. Because if you really want to do differential comparison across a reference with many, with many conditions, you can't just like in a small linear per gene model correct for that. So I think these type of approaches could potentially give you a more clear indication of what's differential. All right. So this is, I think, sort of bridges to the patient level data. Could, you could also call it multi-scale. It gives you some interpretation. All right. So I, I spoke about generative. So this was generative model, but you know, it wasn't really generating that many new samples. So how can we get that? So I had to check in the, the Pope. Um, so for that, let me again take a step back and, and take an example from, from computer vision. And this is an example from computer vision, something like uh, 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 five, six years or so ago. This was sort of when autoencoders were still on, on vogue there, when they, of course, they have since then been replaced. But this, this beautiful example kind of shows you that you know, there's a lot of image-based things happening on faces. So there's, for example, you take a, a representation of men with glasses, subtract men without glasses, and add women with gla without glasses, and suddenly you can start sampling from this category of women with glasses, right? So this, I think that you can call it maybe latent space arithmetics. It's really working nicely, and it really just works in latent space. Because if you do this in pixel space, you know, the, the eye to uh, nose ratio is kind of different from all of us. So that's why you know, putting up glasses does not work there. But it kind of works there because you know, in the latent space, you want to remove that, that, that type of feature. So it sort of cleans things up. So we've been asking, and now comes a fantastic joke, how to put glasses on cells. Appreciate it. So we would like think, you know, how would the perturbation of, of a cell look like if you, for example, add a drug or do a CRISPR or something like that of that. So ideally, let's say we, we, we know how, how this would behave in this cell type here, and then we can sort of predict how it would behave in a new cell type or a new organism you know, or, or a new subject. Or, 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 or things like that. So we can ask, can we predict perturbation effect of a cell type if you know it maybe in other cell types? And, and we, we had this method some time ago, so that's why I won't explain in detail, called SEGEN, where, and this was worked by, by Mo, who now uh, uh, is, is moving on to become a, a PI at Sanger in the UK. But essentially, you, you assume just, just as here, you assume some type of linearity in latent space, and then you sort of just pull up this linearity. This is like this, this simple thing. And it, it actually did work, even though we didn't enforce this linearity. So we showed that we can actually do this quite a bit for this batch effect removal that we discussed before with the condition where it is. And you can even do this uh, uh, very simply here for some type of cross-species prediction. But you know, it's just a single perturbation and this linearity assumption obviously is very strong. So what, what can you do instead? And again, here just sort of what I think we should be going into, and I know, I mean, Karin, as, as we discussed before, that you and I think also, for example, uh, Joshua's lab and so on, they think a lot about 
prediction, or like experimental design. So I think the space of actual perturbation that you can do is just so small so that in this case, I think it's a very good argument that we do need generative models there, right? We kind of want to generate then this, this, this space of putative um, um, effects of a perturbation. Maybe we can't even fully generate it, but maybe we can just sample it or sort of know where something interesting to really then tell us, hey, this might be a good next experiment to do. Maybe not even a single one, maybe also a batch of experiments. And I do, and I really couldn't, I'm so, just so fascinated if you talk to our, our biological partners that they with serendipity kind of come up with this next thing and so often gives you these beautiful results. But I think in sort of 10 years time or so, those biological PIs that have sort of their little AI model suggesting at least one of the next steps could potentially help improve on that. So I think that's, that's, that's where we're going. So one thing that, that, that we asked here is, can we look into, for example, combination of drugs in such a combination of screen? And obviously, you know, if you have many combinations, also many dosages, it just explodes, so there's no way you can set up a screen like that. So instead, uh, we, uh, we, we asked, can we, build up, can we build a model for that? This is collaboration with, with Anna Klimovskaya and David Lopez uh, Pass from, uh, at the time, Facebook, now Meta AI. And the idea is essentially that we, because we want to build a combination model, we build basically a factor model where we build this in latent space, and thereby we can sort of add nonlinearity in, in, in real space, right? So this, this is work by Mo, Yugo, Carlo, and, and Nacho, and you know, with typical architecture just as before. But now you add this, this compositional part here. So you have your perturbations here, and you sort of jointly embed them again, just as, as, as we saw before. But then you sort of build a factor model here, and then you sort of see what the different effects of particular drugs are. Quite, quite straightforward straight way. It might not be the best that you actually want to do that for experimental design. For that, maybe a pure prediction model is, 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 is fine. But, but that's sort of the idea. Of course, what, if you just write it up like that, the problem is that you, know, you could actually encode most of the variation here, so you wouldn't even use this. So basically, you need to add a discriminator on top of that uh, to then uh, make sure that you actually really use that, that, that factor model here. And once you have this, you know, you can, and this just, I mean, obviously, there's some limitation, but you, know, you can sort of really look into novel conditions. You can maybe look in, in uh, um, uh, combinations, but you can also look in this perturbation data space. So let me just show you how this works. So this is uh, from Cyplex screen. I, I should say, I haven't said it before. This is work from Cole Trapnell, and with Cole, we actually followed up with a combination screen to then validate that this works. I, I don't show this here. But in, in that screen, what, they, what, what Cole and his lab did were like three cancer lines, nearly 200 drugs for doses across a bunch of cell lines. And you see, there's actually a very heterogeneous effect. So in contrast to these big differential things that we see in development, this is more subtle. And if you look into perturbation, it's even more subtle, right? So uh, what we did, we, 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 we fitted that model, and then we held out, for example, uh, this Prokino start in a particular cell line. So it's really uh, out of distribution. And you see that our predictions kind of match nicely with the, with the true, true actual observation versus control. And if you do this systematically, so here you see always prediction versus, 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 versus true observation, we see actually a nicely strong uh, correlation with these particular OD predictions that I show here for a bunch of genes, not just these selected ones here. And I think what you actually should do, you should just look at differentially expressed ones because you know the, the zero ones are always easy to predict. But this is, this is working quite well, and you can also see which particular drugs sort of driving most of the variation. In this particular case, it was uh, drugs uh, associated with epigenetic regulation. You now we have this drug embedding, right? So just as, just as before, where we had the embedding of the axis of variation, we can plot this drug embedding space. And this is what we do here. And it's just uh, reduced to two dimensions. So you see basically sort of a bit of the similarity of effect of the drug. So I think, I think we, we had discussion before, we, could you like learn some, some sort of drug embedding space from, from, from phenotypic observation? And this is sort of one of the ways potentially how to do it. And you see there's some similarities here, but there's some dissimilarities here. So you know, that, that, that's interesting. Um, we've been, of course, with this thing, you cannot go out of distribution in terms of drugs. Because you, know, you don't have any context. Drugs are still encoded as ABC or something like that. Um, we've been looking also how to do this for, for genetic perturbations. I think I'm going to skip this one. This, this is a beautiful uh, paper from, from, Weissman, from Jonathan Weissman's lab uh, just next door. And, uh, but I, I, so you basically, you can do something like that for perturbseq, and you can do some type of predictions. So this, 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 is, this is working well. But what I actually wanted to show you is that because you, know, you have your drug perturbation space, you can actually add priors there as well. So you can now, for example, think, um, you know, as, as I said with this per pi, if, if we put a prior on this perturbation space, suddenly it's, it's interpretable and you can interpolate and you can, for example, say, hey, this drug is doing this, this drug is doing this. Can we maybe sort of see in between and sort of come up with maybe new type of um, um, molecules in, in, in that in a potentially generative fashion? So what, what we did, and this is work by, by Leon Hetzel, uh, just came out 
uh, last year at NURBS together with, with Stefan Gunnemann from, from Munich, where we basically built this perturbation uh, network where we encode now molecules here. In particular, encoding, you can do different things here. We tried out a few. And then also have an encoding of the dosage. And what you can then do is you can now try to predict the effect of uh, a single drug where we've been training it on a low dosage, and then we predict its effect also on, on, on a high dosage. You know, low dosage was sort of, which is within the domain, what was predicted. All of the three models sort of do an, an equally well job, where this will be uh, the, the baseline, CPA, and, and, and the, the chemical version of that. But you see, if you go to the higher dosages, you know, this constraint on latent space was actually helping out quite well. And you, know, you, you can quantify this, but what's interesting is that you can, so you're doing a, a better job in, in the highly one, in particular also for the, for, the, for the differential expression ones, which is sort of actually a hard thing to do. But you can also go out of distribution, which you could not do before. And out of distribution, of course, here means that you're sort of still in the region of drug space that you have been observing. But you do see that this, this OD prediction is actually not that bad. <clears throat> and you can also do this for combinations, where you also see that the out of distribution prediction that only ChemCPA can do is quite robust. So this has come out, and it, we just, just came out a few weeks ago, so I just want to show off that, that funny cover that the artists drew there, where you actually see now this machine that takes the cells, decomposes them, you know, this is our factor model. And then you have your, your, your white-coated wet lab collaboration partner putting together a new set of drugs, and yeah. Then, then you sort of decompose your new cells. So yeah, that's, that's the funny sketch. Uh, how we explain size in a short version. So I've been speaking a bit about generative models. I think there's many more ways to discuss, and if, if there's, there's, there's time in the coffee break, oh, or, or the, it's not called coffee break because it's not a conference, so what's, <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, I, I'd be happy also to discuss about the spatial setting. I just want to sort of uh, have a, a, a two or three more principal comments. So this has been this, this beautiful um, sort of perspective paper from uh, Alfredici, I think one of the Rosetta guys, as well as Peter Sorge, he also from, from Harvard Mann, who sort of observed that, you know, we always need to put in these inductive biases into our models, right? It's sort of a, a big thing. If you just write up an MLP for everything, it's maybe not the way to go. And we kind of still do this a bit in our field, right? And, and you know, if you have images, we, you know, we do convolutions. If, if we have you know, 3D structures, we do something that's group invariant. If, if we do um, Sequence data, we used to do it recurrent, now we use attention with position encodings, right? So the idea that they put a forward there, and I think it's really interesting. I don't know if many of you worked on this more sort of classical systems biology field before, but you know, there we had this principal type of models, and now there's like all these data-driven ones. And the argument is, if, if you make those also differentiable, which you, often you can, you can actually sort of start combining them. And they fancy call it differential programming, it's maybe a bit overdoing it, but I think the idea is, is quite nice. And I think if, if you really think about it, many of, of the ongoing ongoing work actually fits a bit in this paradigm that we sort of infuse these models with a bit more prior information. Maybe in a, a sort of a data set that we use for augmentation, but maybe also sort of directly into the model. So for example, what we've been doing here on spatial data is that we describe um, a, a spatial image as a, a sort of a, a neighborhood graph that's sort of colored by the cell type, and then you can predict uh, um, cell communication events. This is work by, by David Fischer, who actually now is a, he's called Eric Schmidt, fellow uh, in, 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 in the audience, if you want to really understand it, talk, talk to him. Or uh, we've been uh, doing, in the, in the decoder, we've been adding um, selection of particular variates and, and uh, variables and then actually making them interpretable by adding prior information about this being sort of particular a gene program or something like that. More recently, and this is, uh, uh, this is on BioArchive, this is to work together with Near Yostas lab, Velo VI, you know, this is sort of this whole batch of new velocity methods mm -hmm. that were coming out, which is also kind of nice, right? So we fit like one, we fit like, uh, uh, like 20,000 ODEs, essentially, for each genes. And, and at the time, with SCV and so on, this was really decoupled from the representation learning. But here now we were able to sort of superimpose these, and that's nice because you have an uncertainty part in the RNA velocity estimation, which I think is really useful. I don't know if, if many of you have tried out RNA velocity, but it does not always work. <laughs> But we often don't tell you that it doesn't work. You know, the uncertainties are not very good. So in this case, you have a bit of an uncertainty model for them. And more recently, uh, this is work particularly by, by Alessandro. We've been also sort of setting up some, some of these, uh, in this case, a bit more of a GAN-based model to also learn then the spatial context sort of make a cell look like how it would be look under this particular perturbation, uh, for example, here for, for an, uh, a cell painting screen. All right. So a question, I think, in order to now link these, these, these type of experiments is, how, how, can we, how can we maybe sort of more generally just take more of this information in? And I think a very general way how to do this, particularly sort of put time points together, is, is, is this idea of optimal transport. And I'm sure many of, of you know this has actually been sort of brought, I think, into the single cell field here by Geoff Schiebinger, 
was it like four, four or five years or so ago, I remember still being uh, sitting together with, with, with Eric in his office because we had this competing method, pseudodynamics, and we sort of talked about it. But I think it's, it's really a fun concept, right? So essentially, it's just sort of you, you want to calculate distance in some sense be, between two. Uh, between two distributions and like an optimal map between these. And there's always all, all kinds of ways to regularize. I won't now say much about the details, but there's a nice uh, figure from Young and, and Caroline at iClear some time ago. And so, for example, I mean, there's many ways how you can use it for perturbations and so on. What you do realize is that this is kind of really nice and useful, but there's not, and there's a bunch of, of, of methods for all kinds of things, integrating temporal, spatial, uh, general data integration, working with data manifolds or perturbations. But it's not that much used in many downstream papers. And I think there's some, some reasons uh, to that. I, I, th I think, for example, it's really powerful, but I think some of these implementations have very different backends. Some of them don't really scale all that much. And sometimes you cannot sort of as easily combine some of these as you would sometimes want to do for your particular application, right? So what we've been uh, thinking about, and this is work by, by Dominic and, and, and Giovanni. Giovanni, who's also in the audience, there's a bunch of, of my lab at the moment visiting Boston, I think, Giovanni for an internship. Microsoft research, right? And so if you want to understand this, he can tell you, but we call this multi-omics uh, single cell optimal transport MOS code. It's on, on BioArchive now and, and the toolbox is out. What we've been sort of uh, wanting to do is sort of go from this typically quadratic for fuse gum of Wasserstein, even worse, uh, scalability to, to linear scalability. And so we actually paired up with, with this, with this o o OT expert, Marco uh, Couturi from, I think first Google, now Apple in Paris, who had this JAX toolbox that, and has sort of a low rank approximation version that really makes this thing scale. So we have now essentially linear complexity. So we really can do the OT now for millions of cells. And we can do this actually across a whole bunch of, 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 of settings, uh, both in temporal, spatial, and also in a multimodal fashion. And we also now have some neural solvers in there, um, such as the ones from, from Caro or from, from Montevideo. So the idea to do that is, you know, you basically take a different incremental setting, could be spatial, could be temporal, you, you do a spatial arrangement, you do your, you calculate your OT, and then you can sort of, independent of your particular OT problem, do then some kind of downstream functions that are sort of shared in that, that package. So it's a bit of an engineering effort as well. And with this, you can do both temporal mapping, spatial mapping, which I think is nice. You kind of want to sort of add your independent data and map it on top of it. You want to do maybe spatial alignment. I think this is something that could be very useful. I think uh, I don't know if Evan is around, but you will be discussed about a 3, 3D, uh, integration and, and, and alignment across slices or just sort of doing differential comparison, or also do it spatial temporal. And this hasn't been done before, but I think that could be, could be quite useful. So let me just show you an example here briefly. This is a developmental data set from, from a mouse embryo um, published la last year where essentially you have, basically for each mouse, you have a, a, spatial, a spatial transcriptomics profile, but of course they are, they are not connected. So what you can now do, you can look at the original annotation of hard cells across these things, but now you can basically transport this not only in gene expression space, but also in spatial morphometry space to the next thing. So you can now learn a map, which we do down here between each of these. And because now you have a map, you can ask which genes most strongly vary, because now you have a sort of joint representation of this thing. And it's, you essentially can run cell rank on, on these, 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 these things. So essentially you can then call, find something like driver genes if it's maybe over, what we call it, so you can basically see what, what drives this process. All right. So I, th I think it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a useful toolbox. Please let us know if you have comments on them. So now, now my last thing, two minutes, if that's okay, Kao, is um, foundation models, right? So I had to bring up that term. I, I think there's a bunch of discussions happening. And I just wanted to briefly also get maybe your input and, and show you one thing that, that we've been doing. So one, I think, of, of, of the really fancy things that recently came up is, is, is gene former that has, I think, this this nice idea of, 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 of ranking genes here, but I do think also using this for position encoding. So I checked again, but let's discuss that. But then essentially just, because otherwise, you know, it wouldn't be doing much, but okay. But then sort of putting this through transformer and then learning it. So it's, I think calling this even foundation model is maybe a bit overkill, but you're just saying like using transformer-based models to do the data representation. But I'm not sure if, if the sequential nature of things that are transformers are usually made for is exactly fitting to our, uh, Problems. I mean, there's like no natural sequential order of our genes, right? So what, what do you do with that? So uh, I think there's interesting questions. And we had a paper something like four years ago, so um, you can still find it by our archive, where we sort of daringly called it deep learning does not outperform uh, logistic regression in cell type prediction. And you know, very often our problems are actually not that hard. So I think if we want to do foundation models, and I think we should be thinking about that. We should really think, do we actually have a hard problem to solve? 
And sometimes, for example, satellite prediction for a long time was not, which is what we show here, right? So I think so, some of these methods, and you know, we, I think you sh surely saw the discussion about SCGPT, but fancy named and so on. Sometimes there's, a, there's, sometimes there's a making a method a bit maybe for, for method's sake and not yet seen if it's actually really sort of this case scaling, which maybe, you know, if you throw more data on top of it, it's the case. But we've been sort of looking a little bit into that. This is work by, by Felix and David Fisher, not related. But when you wanted to do, as far as I know, I'm not sure, David, you need to let me know. <laughs> so uh, uh, that we wanted to but now do the cell type prediction human-wide, okay? So we just go on a specific task, not sort of having one model that, that, that does it all. And you saw, as, as you saw before, so if we just do for two million cells, and now we sort of increase the number of cells, not in a random order, but you know, by, by batches, otherwise it's too trivial, the problem. So we see that here, uh, deep learning and, and linear models sort of perform the same, but if you go up, now you see a, a gap opening up. And in this case, you know, we've been sort of benchmarking a bunch of things. What actually turns out best is, is something that we adapted to the single situation called, called TabNet, which is also a particular transformer that's made for tabular data. So it's kind of a tension-based thing as well. And it's, it's working well, but it's not perfect. So it's apparently not as simple that that problem. So, you know, particular for particular uh, sort of cell types, we're we not really uh, organs, we're not doing the best job. And so there's a bunch of interesting things that you can ask there. And I, I won't sort of go much into detail. This is just ongoing work, so just very recent. But what you can do is you can, for example, now look on your latent space and, and, and just do it on the holdout, because otherwise everything is nice. Because you know, it's a prediction problem, so you can really do it on the holdout. And you can sort of em em embed new cells directly, and you see that on the raw data, yeah, it, it's kind of not really integrated. But if you go now on this tablet embedding, you know, it's sort of really nicely integrated, as you would expect by the cell types, because it needs to predict from these, right? So maybe those latent spaces are meaningful and useful. And, and this is, I think, what I want to say. So, you know, once you have this, you can, of course, derive better data augmentation. And, and, and I, I think it's useful to, to think about these models. But if it's just in a pure tabular fashion or maybe a sort of more ranked one, I think it's still a bit out there and it's fun to discuss. So with this, let me conclude. I spoke a bit about integration, about this first generative models that we've been doing and then sort of going towards these compositional models, a bit about this multi-omics optimal transport, which I think also fun for the spatial setting or the spatial temporal even, and maybe a little bit about the single cell foundation models where things would go. The last plug, so Caroline was mentioning this already, uh, there's also a very nice biomedical computation environment in, in Munich. So if some of you are interested, we have set up this uh, really nice uh, memor interaction for a strategic partnership with the broad. We will be releasing this very soon. So there's funds basically for exchange. There's gonna be a first conference where we actually sort of be, be hands on about this. And I'd be very happy, of course, we're very happy to send people over, but of course also maybe welcome some of you to, to, to Germany. Pandemic is over, we can start traveling again. And you know, in Europe, it's maybe not as, as, as hot, it's maybe not as, as high skyscrapers, but we have high mountains there as well. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Fabian, for a really great talk. Um, so I can bring around a microscope, uh, microscopes, <laughs> microphones. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and otherwise, please come forward also to ask questions, but I'm happy to run if there is someone in the middle. Any questions for Fabian? And there is uh, chocolate for questions. <laughs> I'll do it yeah. like this. <laughs> otherwise, I'll maybe start. So maybe I can start with the perturbation one, the CPA. Um, so even in all of your applications, basically there you only care about the predictions. Mm. You never care about the latent space. So why even care about the encoder? So when, when we started, we really felt we want to sort of have a bit more of an interpretation of what the effect is. So, you know, this, this embedding coordinates of that covariates, you know, this sort of drug embedding or something like that for us felt such a very useful thing to have. That's why we did it. But of course, you know, then there were papers such as Gears and so on coming out that were just purely focusing on the prediction. And it, that, that's harder to, to go about. So. Yeah, I do see the point. So I, I think for purely caring about the effect, like for generating the samples, you, I mean, we wouldn't need to do the encoder. I totally agree. I do think for you know, contextualizing new data sets, let's say there's a, there's a new perturbation one coming in, and then you sort of want to put in the same thing. I think that could be potentially useful to see how they would be integrating. But if, even there, maybe like if, if you're really tough about it, you, you could say, yeah, sure, I just want to sort of design my thing. Just do it on thing. the drugs, right? But on the gene, yeah. gene expression. And also, it's a point we're taking. So actually, for, for the newest things that we do, like for really our experimental design, we, we threw that out. Yeah. We, we learned the hard way. Hi, thanks for the talk. I was um, curious in terms of um, 
both like patient to patient variability from um, the data integration perspective, as well as um, challenges from from batch effects and kind of how how those technical factors um, are accounted for and separated from um, biological signal. That was one question I had. And then the other question I had was, um, I know 10x is overwhelmingly what we use in single cell, mm -hmm. but um, I, I was curious, particularly um, from an annotation perspective and really right. grounding these annotations, um, if you could, I'm curious, like if you found like SmartSeq data versus 10x data more useful in terms of having your baseline of what is what. So f f first one, I, I, I do agree that there's of course always this big danger if you do as Dana often calls it, smooshing out the data on top of a sort of an integrated manifold is that you lose tag integration, right? I mean, in a sense, I, 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 the, I mean, the optimal integration method would be the one where everything is mapped to a single point because then, you know, all the metrics are fine because, I mean, there's no variation left anymore. So surely you want to make sure that, so it's like, it's, in my opinion, it's a, it's a trade off. You can keep all of the variation, you just kind of remove it, and you can have something in between. But ideally, you want to sort of guide it towards sort of removing, let's say, essay specific variation, but sort of keeping potential one that is sort of left minus the essay. It's not very clear to say what is actually biologic variation, and probably that's why I think sort of looking at it one scale higher and so on is important. But having said that, we try to come up with some metrics to capture that. So we had this, this data integration benchmark metrics thing, we call it SCIB, it was Nature Methods like two years ago, so looking at. And this has been kind of useful for us. So essentially, we've been using this to rank integration method performance on a particular data set, but it gives you sort of things for sort of cluster homogeneity, that's sort of how well it's integrated, but it gives you also sort of retainment of some interesting odd sort of biological variants, such as, you know, is, are some particular cell cycle differentiation states okay? So you have sort of metrics for both, and I think that's kind of how you need to deal with it. Out practice. of curiosity, say, like in a disease setting where you start to observe like extreme biological heterogeneity, like how do you, do you see difference in that? Or? Yeah, so that, a discussion we, we, we had actually in, 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 in the graph. <laughs> oh. Two questions. Two a, a discussion we, we, we had in, in, uh, in HCA actually also first to get started, like should we only do a healthy atlas or should we add uh, disease samples right away? Or should we just project, right? And what you do see, for example, in different cancer settings is that you know, the healthy ones kind of sort of are here, but then cancer is sort of all over because, you know, there's all these new strange things ha happening. So if you really want to represent the variation properly, you actually sort of need to not just project these on top, because otherwise you might sort of lose interesting axioms, but you sort of do this jointly. You can't always do this, and I mean, I haven't shown those, but for example, for this lung cell atlas, because we had so many COVID samples, that was a thing that you were able to get in lung in the past few years, right? Uh, we saw that the axis of variation there was, um, so the variation in COVID samples was much higher than on some sort of small data sets, and so there we actually needed to reintegrate. Yeah. The second part of your question was about 10x, and 10X yeah, smart seek, exactly. So um, we do see that these, like if, if, if data is large enough and sort of sufficiently heterogeneous that different versions of a 10x protocol, a droplet protocol, as well as also full read ones do seem to be do, do seem to integrate rather nicely. So also even nucleus and RNA. If you were interested, you could even try to learn the style that sort of makes the one turn into the other. It's like a style transfer question. Can you draw my data that has been 10 x into a, in a SmartSeq 2 style or something like that? So that, 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 that's okay, but what's the information that's been gained there? So there has been one paper from a junior PI uh, at our place called SC Power, so power analysis, which I do think is actually quite interesting. In this case, he looked just for uh, power analysis uh, for differential expression. But the question is, you know, if you want to optimize, let's say, number of cells versus sort of depth of the, uh, in terms of reads, and you could, so you could do that also for experimental protocol. What interestingly turned out, if you want to maximize for a fixed budget uh, differential expression, it's better to go for more cells with less reads than the other way around. And that sort of tells you that it's like, you know, these plate-based assay maybe do have a problem there. Um, having said that, I think there could be a way where you, you want to sort of really use the full length nature of things to look for splice variants and that. Sure, obviously, you know, you can't do that with the other stuff. Or also for better ways for, for doing RNA velocity versions or so, where you know, really have uh, something like, you know, this one, this, in, this, 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 this intron is there, this is all gone, and you can sort of build this up in a better fashion. 
And I was hoping at some point that long read sequencing would, would help it, but I think it has not. Is anyone working on long read sequences in single cell setting? What do you find? <laughs> it's fine. Maybe we we'll do it later. But but it's, I had discussion. I, I was thinking, you know, could we use this for for velocity type of models? And I think at the, at the moment it's not because it's just yes no, but it's not fully quantitative. Have you done much analysis looking at uh, single cell like long read RNA isoform? Mm -mm. I don't know. I, there has been this. I think early on when 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 SmartSeq uh, two maybe even before three came out was sort of getting robust. There have been a few papers sort of trying to model bursting kinetics and so on. And at some point, also, I think one or two that were looking for splice frames, but I yeah. haven't seen much there. So Yeah, but now no. with long reads, you can actually get like the full length of like these single molecules. Yeah. So like splicing is going beyond just junctions, right? You're actually getting... Kind but of you don't get counts really very robust, right? Because so you, you have so few reads. So it's like... That's changing. I, I think yeah. you need to, need to enrich it somehow with the uh, with, uh, uh, end uh, type, type of, 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 of models. I don't know if you see that. Yeah, but I, th I think that the idea of having like much less counts is changing like yeah. over the years. So new okay, also oh, you're, you're getting more with new protocols. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah, 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 new protocols, new sequencers. So. But yeah. I do think you know, that we have a protocol, which is 10x whatever, a droplet-based, mm -hmm. end-based one, that gives us a lot of counts. I think you should basically integrate that distribution-wise with the sort of free, free, few ones that you have, and maybe jointly you, you get it without waiting for the new experiment. But yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. that's what's happening now. Like data integration is being yeah. short and long, but with the droplet-based methods, you're of course um, kind of three prime yeah. bias or five prime bias. But uh, you know, there's that intermediate full-length cDNA which you can capture in sequence now. So thanks a lot, man. It's going to be really interesting. To use <laughs> get some chocolate. Last chocolate gone. Here you go. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I think we should take the questions yeah. um, outside to coffee. So thank you all for coming, and yeah, we'll we'll continue questions outside if that's okay. So thank you Thanks. very much, Fabian, for a wonderful talk.